When talking about the 2023 NBA draft class, most people start and end with Victor Wimbanyama, and for good reason. He's probably going to be a generational talent. However, this draft class is more than just one or two guys deep. In fact, Rafael Barlow here on Locked on Kings today is going to explain why this draft class is actually really good for a team like the Sacramento Kings looking for complementary players. Rafael Barlow, an amazing draft analyst, joins me right here on Locked on Kings. You are Locked On Kings, your daily Sacramento Kings podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it is that time, time for another episode of Locked On Kings. Hello and welcome to Locked On Kings, your podcast hub for Sacramento Kings coverage all off season long. Today's episode is brought to you by Prize Picks. First time users can receive a hundred percent instant deposit match up to one hundred dollars with promo code Locked On. That's PrizePicks.com promo code Locked On. My name is Matt George. I have the privilege of being your host here. I'm a Sacramento sports reporter and producer for ABC Ten News. Rafael Barlow is someone who I've had here on Locked On Kings uh, pretty much every summer, multiple times a summer over the last handful of seasons. When it comes to NBA draft analysts, NBA draft experts, someone who has committed their life, essentially, their talents to scouting basketball talent, Rafael Barlow is just about as good as it gets. Uh, he is the uh, the director of scouting over at the, the NBA Big Board, uh, does phenomenal work for the Locked On Podcast Network. I mean, if you're not familiar with Rafael's work, you need to be. He goes not just all over the state, he goes all over the world all year long scouting the best and next basketball uh, talent. So to get him here on Locked On Kings is always a treat. He's so nice with his time. Again, you're going to hear great stuff uh, about uh, this this upcoming draft class. He's going to talk about his experience at the, uh, the draft combine this past week. And I also have five different players that you on social media said you wanted to hear about. We're asking Rafael directly. Uh, for for his input uh, on these guys. A lot of them I think you're going to be excited hearing about potentially targets for the Sacramento Kings at 24. So here it is, my conversation with Rafael Barlow. It's draft season. That means we have to have the director of scouting at NBA Big Board, Rafael Barlow, back here on the Lockdown Kings podcast, fresh off a very, very busy week at the NBA Draft Combine. Rafael, you've been a friend for the show for years. Normally I have you on because we're talking about lottery picks and potential game changers for the Sacramento Kings. This time they made the playoffs. They're looking for a decent talent, someone to help them go further at pick 24, but it's certainly not a make or break pick. A different position for the Sacramento Kings to be in, but a position, quite frankly, I'm enjoying. I still get to have you on and not as much as on the line, so I love it. First of all, congratulations to you <laughs> and the Sacramento Kings fans. I know we talked about it for like since I've been on Locked On, is this the year that the streak ends? Is this the year? I mean, you wore a purple cape. You had a cat. <laughs> you did everything. And now you, I mean, you have to be very optimistic about the future and glad to be picking at number 24. I mean, like, and and it's your pick at number 24, not somebody else's pick at number 24. So For sure. Um, to watch the draft lottery and to not have any investment in it other than wondering where Victor Wimbanyama is going to go. Boy, what a, a freeing feeling that is. Now the goal is to be the game on after the draft lottery so that we can see the draft lottery and then watch Kings basketball after that. That's the next step for the Sacramento Kings. But before we get into what's coming up, the upcoming draft, I just want to get your your two cents really quick on what you thought of Keegan Murray, his rookie season with, uh, with Sacramento and uh, being taken fourth overall last draft. Yeah, man, I thought he had a a good season and not only did he have a good season but he had a good season contributing to a team with a good record so he was in a, a very unique position like how often are you a top five pick and you're going to a team that is was, was as good as Sacramento was and so I think that you know the numbers probably would have been better if he went on a, a team that you know was in the Wimbayama sweepstakes but I, I feel like Sacramento you know, made the right choice in a sense. They got a lot of heat for it. You know, a lot of people and I and I and I actually had this conversation with with someone that works for the Kings that I saw at the combine. A lot of fans are lumping 
this new front office into like all the past front offices and saying, you know, same old Kings, yada, 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 you know, from the Halliburton trades drafted Keegan Murray. And I mean, <laughs> it's a new front office and it's a, it's a whole new, everything in Sacramento the team is winning. So Keegan Murray been a contributor on a good team with what, what the second seed in the West. Uh, third seed. Third seed. I mean, what more can you ask for? So, I thought he played great. And you might be able to get his brother at 24. <laughs> we might bring up Chris at some point during this conversation, although I got some names for you that I'm going to ask you about. These are names submitted by Locked on Kings listeners and Kings fans who want to hear a little bit about these guys. We'll get to that in a second. But first, Rafael, tell me about this draft class in period, the 2023 draft class. We know about the very top and the expectations at the very, very top. But what do you think about this draft class in general in terms of like talent, how deep it is, certain positions. Just when you when you think twenty twenty three cl- draft class, you're summing it up. But what are you saying? I think this is a class that is loaded with really good complementary players. But even if you look at the worst teams from San Antonio to Detroit to Houston, Charlotte, they all in a sense have their have their dudes, like the guys that they are going to build around. You could say San Antonio maybe doesn't, but Keldon Johnson was good. He was an Olympian. Charlotte has LaMelo Ball. Houston has Jalen Green and Jabari Smith and Alperen Shingun. Detroit has Cade Cunningham. Jaylen. I mean, so the teams have their guys. And I think in this draft, you're going to be able to find really good complementary pieces to play alongside the guys that teams are giving the keys to their franchise for. So... I think it's a, a pretty good draft. Obviously, it's it's um, you know, there's a superstar, you know, quote unquote generational talent at the top, but I still think it is a good class that's not just top heavy. Talk to me about this combine a little bit. What were your takeaways from all the work that you do? Anything stand out? Any certain players stand out? I have one specifically I'm going to ask you about, but you might touch on them here. Uh, but what what was your combine experience this year? It was great. It was my second experience and. Just big shout out to Locked On for for the platform. I had it, it was just kind of weird that I had multiple people come up to me and tell me that they listen to the podcast. It was a Kings employee. He came, he comes up to me and he tells me that he has a long commute and he listens. So I, I thought that was pretty cool. Um, just you know, the second year is it was the first year was kind of like eye opener. The second year, I definitely felt like. People know who I am. So big thank you to David Locke and the Locked On um, company for giving me the platform, which actually introduced me to Chad, which helped me get NBA Big Board. So it, it was a great experience. Long, long days, really, really long days, like 9 a.m. to like 1230. I was in the arena. Part of it was because the arena had good Wi-Fi. And, you, you know, when you're on the road and you're uploading a 30 minute podcast you need really good wi-fi so uh but no it was a great experience well the work that you do man is second to none and you've been it's not just starting over the last couple of years that you've been going to the combine i mean you've been nailing it with these uh draft classes and draft analysis for for a long time that's why so many people in sacramento look forward to when you come on locked on kings because you're you're gonna uh, notice things that some of us miss and tell like it is with these players and one of these players that i got really excited about when i read one of these tweets it, it jumped up on my feet i had to save it like i gotta ask Raphael about this you had a tweet about Derek Lively and his uh, draft stock going up. You said you were out there working and in, uh, in the arena and he was just burying uh, threes. And we know Derek Lively is a really good shot blocking prospect, rebounding prospect, seven footer. He's someone that I've started to imagine. Hey, if he could somehow slide to 24, sounds like based off that tweet, that ain't going to happen. You say he's moving up. He's ain't moving down. So tell me a little bit about what you've seen from Derek Lively. Yeah. So, um, so like I said, I would be in the arena Late and um, about 1130 every, every night, I'd see a group of guys from Clutch come in. And what, what's cool about the Clutch guys is that their agents were out there doing the rebounding and passing. It wasn't a trainer. So they come in like the first night, Colin Sexton had, had came in and he was in town because he represented the Jazz at the lottery. But they were coming in, they would get their work. And while I'm like kind of typing or waiting for my video to upload, I'm kind of peeking and and looking and I see Lively. He's in the corner, just draining threes. 
on one hand, I'm not too shocked by it because he showed flashes of being able to shoot threes uh, on the grassroots circuit, but only took 13 threes at Duke this year, only made two. But he is someone that I think could eventually become a, a floor spacer. And it's, you know, I know some people are saying, oh, well, you know, one year, and, and it's, it's a perfect example. Somebody said, well, we saw Willie Colley Stein <laughs> knocking down threes and 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 I guess like some some videos in the summer which is true Willie lives in Dallas and I've seen him work on <laughs> nothing but threes and guard skills in the summer and then it's like once the season starts the team is like uh no your job is to rebound <laughs> block shots get back down in, in the block but I do think Lively could end up being like a, a potential pick and pop five and so if he's a you know 10 rebound per game guy, rim protector that can knock down open shots and catch lobs. In my opinion, I don't see why he can't be a top 10 pick. We're Sorry. Going... If you want him at 24. I don't oh, think he's... <laughs> You know what? The, I'm, I prefer realistic, even if it crushes my dreams, truth be told, but we're very familiar with Willie Colley Stein. Trust me here in Sacramento. We know, we know very well about that, that package. Although I thought Willie got a bad rap because he's a hell of an awesome dude. But yeah. other than that, um, Speaking of like comparisons of Derek Lively, do you think like a Brook Lopez comparison is accurate? Not necessarily young Brook Lopez, who people forget was like a, a, a beast in the post and he's completely yeah. changed his game to now a shot blocking, rebounding floor spacer. Like in, in a lot of ways, the Sacramento Kings could use a Brook Lopez tr- type. Could Derek Lively be that or is that a little uh, inaccurate of a comp? Uh, yeah, I, I, I personally think it's inaccurate because I still see Brooke Lopez as a guy that you could give the ball to on the block. He was a scorer. I think he had like 19 points a game in his New Jersey days. Yep. Maybe if Lively is 35, or I don't even know how Brooke is, but I'm guess 33 year old Brooke Lopez, then, then that works. Initially when I first saw him in high school, I thought, he could be like a Tyson Chandler. I don't know if the motor is as strong as Tyson Chandler's or is revved up, but if he's like a poor man's Tyson Chandler with a little bit of floor spacing, then that's a win. So if he ends up being, whether it's Jared Allen or Nick Claxton or one of those guys, I think in a redraft, if he ends up being that guy, you can get lottery value out of him. Like I said at the top of the show, today's episode is brought to you by Prize Picks and their $1 million daily Superflex promotion for the NBA playoffs and finals happening right now. Every day of the playoffs and finals, one Prize Pick user will win a chance at becoming a millionaire. One entry placed after 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time will be randomly selected each day. Whoever placed that entry will be given a six pick flex with the following payouts. If you get all six picks correct, you get a million dollars. You get five correct picks, $80,000, four correct picks. $16,000. You can find full details at pricepicks.com slash million. When I say picks, the way price picks works, you pick two to six players, and if they will go score more or less in their prize picks projection, you can win up to 25 times your money if you get those picks right. No competing against other people. It's just you versus the available projections, and prize pick offers projections not just for the NBA, although this promotion is specific to the playoffs and the finals. Uh, they also have it for the NFL, MLB, NHL, PGA, college sports, combat sports, uh, sports overseas, European sports, professional soccer, things of that nature. They have it all for you. Entries can be made in 60 seconds or less. It's that easy. They offer safe and fast withdrawals and are currently operational in over 30 states and in Canada. Download the PrizePix app or go to prizepix.com to sign up and play daily fantasy sports right now. First time users can receive 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with promo code locked on. You deposit $100, you get $100 free. You deposit $50, you get $50 free. Don't forget to enter promo code locked on and sign up for an instant deposit match up to $100. I'm going to ask you about five guys that the Sacramento Kings fandom submitted on social media when they found out you were joining me. The first is uh, is the small forward out of Duke, Derek Whitehead. Uh, uh, what do you think about Derek Whitehead and, and what he brings? And, and all of these guys I'm going to ask from the perspective of just what you think is players, and then if you could tie in a little bit if you want to their potential to be available at the 24 range and what you think they could bring to a team like Sacramento who is trying to build upon a playoff appearance and is looking for guys to help them accomplish that. Yeah, I, I think Whitehead will be in that range. Coming into the season, he was a guy that a lot of people thought was a top five pick. I know me personally, I didn't really see it, but he comes from great pedigree, great background. 
everybody that I've talked to that knows him just raves about his personality and his character. And he went to Montverde, which is like a powerhouse high school. I think he played with Cade Cunningham and a, a bunch of guys. And they said he was on the team since he was in like eighth grade. So he's been around winning basketball. He knows how to play with, with great players. And unfortunately, he had a, a foot injury in, in the preseason. And I, he was someone that I really wanted to see because while I saw like the flashes, I didn't know exactly what he brought to the table. He reminded me of like a a bigger Lance Stevenson. That's what I first saw out of him in high school. And then when he like broke his foot and he came back kind of late in the season. Well, it wasn't late in the season, but he missed like the preseason and so on. And it, he he accepted like a very reduced role at, at Duke where he was more so of a three-point shooter. Showed some flashes of, you know, what he showed in high school, but I mean, he was lights out. I want to say he shot like 43% in a very limited role as a three-point shooter. And he's someone that I think it kind of, I mean, obviously he's not going to go where he thought he was going to go. I, I think he'll be around in the mid twenties, but he did show that if he's not the athlete that people think he is, and he's not this, this ball handler and shot creator, that he can play a role as a floor spacer and every team in the NBA needs floor spacing. So he has a great body and at the minimum, he should be able to knock down shots. And then if all the other stuff comes together, then whoever selects him in the twenties, which is where I think he'll go because he's um, he's had to have a second surgery. Then I, then I think you can get really good value out of him there. This is the only shooting guard that I have on the list to ask you about. The rest of them are small forwards, but uh, from the G League, City Sissoko, uh, a lot of Kings fans a little bit interested, although there's kind of a log jam at that position. Not that the Kings can't go small if they decide to say bye-bye to Harrison Barnes, maybe move Kevin Herter to the three. Uh, but what do you think about Sissoko as, a, uh, as a, a draft prospect? I like him. I like him a lot. He's a guy that I was familiar with before the season with the G League because he played in Spain. And I followed him. He's, he's a French kid. I followed him playing for the French national team. Good body, strong frame. He's skilled. He can pass the ball. Uh, shows some flashes, been able to get his own shot. I mean, his, his outside shooting, it, it's a work in progress. But I think he's capable of being a reliable shooter. But he really grew and developed this year playing for the Ignite. And uh, I talked to his teammate, Pujetter, who's, who's a friend of mine, and he was just kind of telling me how, well, basically he was selling him. He was like, if you look at what City's done, look at the numbers. Out of all the wings in the G League, he led the wings in dunks. And he's like, he's gotten a lot better as far as being aggressive and attacking the basket. My knock on him coming into the season was he settled for jump shots. If he had a switch for the big, instead of like attacking him and going to the rim, he would settle for a step back. But I don't know what what flip, what switch was flipped. But all of a sudden, by January, February, he was coming down the lane. He was dunking. He was finishing in traffic. And it really showed me something different from him. And so I think right away he should be able to contribute defensively. But if he gets the shot down and then you mix it in with his natural feel as a passer and his ability to get downhill, then I think he could be good also. Is he one of those guys where the talent and the upside – outweighs the lack of fit or in, in the Sacramento Kings sense, like I said, the Kings have a lot of players at that position, but if he's there at 24, the talent and upside is enough for you to say, we'll figure out that position problem later. Yeah. I mean, I think if honestly, I think whoever they select at 24 is going to have a difficult time, like really cracking the rotation. If the roster stays as is, and then you have a, a, another rookie that I think is coming from Olympiacos who was the Euro League MVP yep. and lost a, a heartbreaking game today. I think that he's probably more ready to contribute than whoever they select at 24. So I, I, I do think the Kings are just, they just have to take the best player available and then figure out the fit later on. And, you know, maybe the guy learns for a year and then has a, a bigger role in year two. And I mean, you just never know, but I, I think like right now fit is probably not the best to look for at number 24. 
Moving on to a teammate of Victor Wenbanyama. I know he didn't get as much attention because of the guy he was playing next to, but still had some great moments this season from the limited that I was able to watch and pay attention. Uh, Bilal Kubalali, uh, sorry, Kubala, Kubali, if I can say his name correctly, he's not going to come to Sacramento because we can't pronounce his name over here. Uh, the small forward from the Metropolitans 92. Uh, what do you think about him? It's a crazy story, man. And January 2020. Two. I'm in Paris, and and I'm trying to make the story as not the long version, but in 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 Paris or in France, they have like it's called the Espars League. It's like the under twenty one league. So it's basically the JV league, and then the varsity game. So like the JV game is maybe at like five o'clock, and then the the senior team game maybe like eight, sometimes nine o'clock. So I went to the game and I was actually with Mike Schmitz, who was working for ESPN Draft Express at the time, who's now the assistant general manager of the Showblazers. And we're watching the game and and we see this kid, long arms, fluid, made a couple of plays. And we don't I mean, we don't know his name. So we're like literally going online trying to find his name. And it's like, hmm, this this could be someone that down the line, way down the line, could be a potential NBA player, a name to monitor. Fast forward, he has a pretty good summer on the French under-18 national team. Not big numbers, but just showed some progression. I want to say average like seven points a game. Again, not numbers that pop out at you. Then in September last year, I went to go watch Wimbayama play, and I went to the under-21 game, and I see I see Bilal. He's like showing out. He had like 21 points. He's blocking shots. He's making passes. He's running the floor. So now in my mind, I'm thinking – this is a guy that I'm going to keep eye out on as a potential 2024 draft pick. He plays a game in Vegas during the whole Wimbayama Scoot Showcase. Looks totally lost. Doesn't really do anything. Most people won't even remember the minutes he was on the floor. Fast forward, some injuries happen. He gets an opportunity to play, and now he is <laughs> a lock to go in the first round. I mean, so I still don't have to say this. His trajectory over the last 18 months has been crazy. Probably one of the biggest I've ever seen. From unknown, I mean, he wasn't really even known in France, to now a potential first. I mean, I think he's a first-round pick, but he can go somewhere in the middle of the first round. The additional exposure playing next to Wimbayama on top of his development makes him probably like the draft's biggest mystery man that... It's going to be interesting where he goes because more than likely he's not going to be able to work out for teams. So teams are going to have to draft him strictly based off what they're seeing on, on film and watch it in person. Do you think is, is it, is he a better fit or more likely fit or player for a team that is already established and can take the time without taking a lot of risk to, to see what he is and what he turns into? Or do you think it would be better for him to go to a team that, maybe has high hopes for him and will give him playing time to just figure it out, even at the cost of wins early in his career? That's a good question. That's a really good question. I think that on one hand, I think from like the agent player perspective, you want to go to a team where you can come in and, and get minutes right away because he's, he's probably out of all the guys in this draft, he probably has the smallest sample size. Because, again, he's come out of nowhere. This is his first season playing professionally, and he wasn't getting real minutes until maybe, what, March or something like that. But the team, is if they make a deep playoff run, then it could end up being, you know, maybe 30 or 40 games where teams can actually evaluate him playing heavy minutes. On the other hand, you know, you, you go to a winning team, I think he's fine there because he's already playing a role now that he'll probably play in the NBA while other guys that are like the man on their college teams or stars, they're going to have to scale down a bit and learn how to fit in. And I think for him, like I said, because he hasn't really been the man or being featured, I think the the role he's playing now is very similar to what he would play for, you know, let's say it is Sacramento. He may best case scenario be a 10 to 15 minute per game guy but he doesn't need to be featured to be effective. He'll get his points off hustle plays, running the floor, knocking down open shots. So, I mean, it's a long answer, but I think he's he's good either way, which I can't say for every other player. 
I had Sam Ferris uh, from from the draft uh, draft dummies and one of the contributors to Locked On uh, NBA Big Board. I had him on last week talking about potential prospects, and one of the the five that he uh, identified for the Kings was Maxwell Lewis out of Pepperdine. Kings fans want to hear, hear and learn a little bit more about uh, about Lewis. What do you think of him? So I got a little little intel for you. Oh, <laughs> so I was in Chicago at the combine, and I want to say it was Thursday or Friday. I got access to his private workout at the University of Illinois Chicago. And Max is going to be really good. Like he, I mean, from his body to the athleticism to the, his ability to create shots. And I've been to a lot of workouts. I've seen a lot of guys work out up close and personal. But the way he shot the ball at this particular workout, if he shoots the ball like he shot it in this workout with NBA team private workouts, he's he's going to rise. Um the biggest concern about him is he doesn't have like a traditional path. Like he told me that right after high school, he did this, this year it's supposed to be like a professional development year where you just work on your game and COVID hit. So that obviously didn't work out. And then he played his freshman year at Pepperdine, had an injury, and then he had a really good year this year. But what I didn't realize is that he say he just started playing at 14. So we're talking about a guy that is a, I think is going to be a first round pick that may have just six total years of basketball experience. So the sky's the limit for him. We see him in a lot of mocks and in a lot of uh, boards in that twenties range. So right around where the Sacramento Kings are expected to be or stay on draft night. But I mean, what do you think if he's going to rise, do you think he could sneak his way into late lottery? Just be just outside the lottery. Like how far does that rise go? Do you think if, if he, continues what you saw in that private workout honestly i think he is it's really going to depend on how teams view his season like he played at pepperdine they had a absolutely horrible record and he mentioned to me that that's one of the main things that teams are asking why was your team record bad um there may be like a stigma that he didn't contribute to winning basketball he put up big numbers on a losing team and so on. So I think if if he's able to like address those concerns in the interview process, then I think it'll be fine. There are some teams that are concerned about his defense. I'm gonna say that he's uh he didn't have to play defense and he wasn't held accountable. And sometimes that scares teams because they're like, if we bring in a guy that wasn't held accountable in college when he was the man, how is he going to respond to to difficult coaching? I think he'll be fine. Um, but I like I said, I think his draft range is going to depend on, again, how well he works out. But if teams are concerned that he was just a guy that put up good numbers on a bad basketball team. Final guy that uh, the, the Kings fans want to hear about, Leonard Miller, another G League or small forward. What do you think about him? So Leonard is a, another guy similar to Bilal that has had a crazy, crazy trajectory. I was at the combine last year, and I'll be honest, he was the absolute worst player at the combine he looked lost he did not look like he fit in and I remember like getting messages from people from Canada and they're like how did he look and I was just like I'll be honest man he looked lost but it was kind of like the plan his agency kind of found him basically dominating like a smaller league in Canada and he was playing like point forward showed point guard skills and so on so there was some intrigue there, but putting him in the combine last year was just a way to see what he needed to work on, how he react. And they just kind of threw him out in the fire. And when they threw him out in the fire, I mean, like I said, he looked bad, goes to the Ignite this year, totally different player, develops. I was at a game this year where he had 20 points and 20 rebounds against the Texas Legends. And he's someone that has really – really like improved his draft stock. But what's interesting is that um, he was more so like a fan favorite on social, social, social media last year because he was like unknown and intriguing. And then this year it's like he had a great year and people aren't really paying attention. He doesn't have the same, same buzz. And so I think that he is in that range 
But if he plays like he played in March, and I was just looking for the numbers, it was something crazy. And again, I was at I was at one of the games where he had 20 points and, and 20 rebounds. But I want to say like he averaged like 17 points, 11 rebounds on like 50, 40 something shooting um in the second half of the season. All right, I got it. In March, Leonard Miller, 22 points, 12.9 rebounds, two assists, a steal, and 1.7 blocks, 64% from the floor, 58% from three, 90% from the foul line. Those were his shooting stats in March. But it went so under the radar. You, you, and you, you even undersold those splits, man. Yeah, I was wrong. And and yeah, it was again, and like I said, it wasn't like it was one game. You know, like sometimes at the end of the season you see a guy in NBA rookie in April and you see it was like two games. It was the whole month of March, and I was at one of the games where he had 20 rebounds. And he's playing totally different. Like I thought he was going to be like this point forward. And I know that's probably the role that he wants to play, but with Scoot on the team and some of the other guys and ball handlers, he had to accept this, this role as like a dunker spot big and he accepted it and was one of the best rebounders in the G league as a teenager. But the biggest thing about Leonard Miller that I enjoy was, I don't know if you remember at the ignite versus Wimbyama, Wimbyama Scoot versus Victor sweepstakes. Victor had a nasty dunk on Leonard Miller. I mean, if you just Google it or go to YouTube, you'll see like he, I mean, it was a poster. I think Leonard even fell on the floor. Hmm. He got back up, no expression, and went and was still trying to block shots right after that. And like I said, it was a big showcase. The whole world is watching. He got embarrassed, and he bounced right back up and hustled down the floor and that let me know right there that that he's he's different. He's not someone that is afraid of looking bad, and he just gets better. He just, he just gets better. He's gotten better over the years. So I like Leonard Miller a lot. You know, you alerted to or alluded to earlier in our, our conversation, Sasha Vazenkov from Olympiacos, uh, the twenty or ne- nearly twenty eight year old who's theoretically coming over to join the Sacramento Kings uh, in time for next season. What do you think of him, his game? I know you've watched him a lot. You you said he has a a higher likelihood of being a contributor for the Kings immediately than whoever they take it at number 24. Uh, But I mean, we got to be realistic about someone whose draft rights were were traded for a second round pick. Someone who is a EuroLeague MVP. Absolutely. So was Nemanja Bielitsa. And he was very, very good in in Europe and and had some solid uh, years for the Sacramento Kings here. But what do you think Vazenkov's NBA status looks like or or skill and and career looks like? Yeah, I think he's, uh, you know, he'll be able to come in and provide some shooting. I'm not saying that he's going to set the world on fire and, and be like Luka. But even if he's Bogdan Bogdanovich, I mean he's he's coming in a lot older than Bogdan was, and and, and Bogdan's a, a friend of mine, a guy that I've known from back when I lived in Turkey. Um, so the situation is there are some similarities, but it's a little bit different because Bogdan was obviously a, a lot younger, but Bogdan was never MVP of the Euro League. Now I will say this: MVP of the Euro League is not like MVP of the NBA where you're like the best player. He's one of the best players, but in, in the Euro league, in order to win MVP, it is heavily based on your team success. So, um, and that's why, um, oh, I can't think of the guy's name. Bielitsa. That's why he was able to win it. I don't think he was the best. I think he always projected as a top eight to nine rotation man in the NBA, but he played on winning teams. And in Europe, if you're averaging 12 points a game on a winning team, you're <laughs> on the top team, you're in the MVP race because averaging like 17 a game in Europe is like averaging 25 in, in the NBA. So, uh, but I, I do think that he can come in and contribute. I'm curious to see how long it lasts because if he goes to Sacramento, again, if he's your seventh, your eighth man, if he's a 15 to 18 minute a game guy, does it really make sense for him to stay unless he just really likes the lifestyle, but he's in Greece, Athens. I mean, he's living in a good place. 
and he's the man. So we'll we'll just see if if um he thinks it's the best fit for him. And then this final guy that I'm going to ask you about, uh, Kings fans didn't really list him because we've talked about him a lot already, but he's got the connection with uh, the Sacramento Kings already. Keegan Murray, Chris Murray, uh, both from Iowa. What do you think of Keegan's younger brother, Chris, his twin brother, uh, and what he could bring to an NBA team, could potentially bring to the Sacramento Kings? Is he just a kind of, and I say this with all due respect, is, is he just a worse version of Keegan or is Chris Murray his own basketball player in, in, in some ways? I think there's some similarities. I think some people try to say that they're they're different. He may not be as good as as Keegan, but I do think that he is similar. I think he could be a better shooter. Uh, let me let me say this. I think on paper he could be a better shooter, but he's not as consistent. He'll go through these long stretches where he may miss like you know, eight in a row, but then he'll he'll get hot and then it, it just evens out to being like a really respectable percentage. Um, but he's a good defender, similar to his brother, not like the most explosive or super athletic guy, but just can move his feet, can block shots, can defend multiple positions. But the thing about Chris, and I always got to make sure I don't say Keegan, what a team like Sacramento gets from Chris is you get a, a rookie that is ready to come in and contribute right away. Like there's, he's not a guy that you got to wait two years. And the way I look at it is he is someone that you'll be able to get early. If he's a first round pick, which I think he should be, you'll be able to get some, some of his prime years while he's on a rookie deal. And how often do you get, do you get that? I think he'll be 23 on draft night. So if he ends up being there for four years, you'll be able to get him at what 25 26 on a rookie deal and that is a great value so even though it may seem a little cliche to draft you know <laughs> have the two brothers on the team I, I would not hesitate if he if he's available and some of the guys that have higher upsides are gone I mean I wouldn't hesitate to select him Rafael, you're incredible, man, the work that you do. Uh, I hope you get a little bit of rest now that the combine's over, but I know things are just heating up for you as the draft gets closer and closer. Of course, you're posting your boards, your mocks, everything like that uh, over at NBA Big Board and all the great work that you do there, my friend. Uh, keep it all. Uh, keep up all the great work. I'll, I'll selfishly try and steal your time again as the draft gets closer or after the draft or whatever it may be, but I appreciate you so much. Sacramento appreciates you, uh, so uh, thanks so much, my guy. Anytime. And once again, congratulations that we are not here talking about a top five pick. Oh, it's a blessing. It's just a blessing. <laughs> Big thank you to Raphael for joining me here on Locked on Kings. I mean, he, he's just a wizard when it comes to draft coverage and when it comes to prospect scouting. Uh, and he is, I mean, he's already a star now, but trust me, five, ten years from now, we're going to look at and hear about Raphael Barlow as one of the best talent scouts i think in the country and it wouldn't surprise me at all if uh there's some interest in in rafael having an actual front office job or something like that if he's interested or an actual scouting job for a team uh one day he's that good he's that talented and he's that wonderful uh so to have him here on locked on kings is a real real pleasure appreciate your support as always if you want to talk about any of the prospects that we talked about any names that we didn't talk about that you want to submit into the sweepstakes for the kings at 24 any more prospects you want to hear more about during this draft process i have two more draft experts from Locked On who are also at the Draft Combine coming uh, later this week that I think you're really going to enjoy. So if there are other guys you want us to talk about in more detail, let me know. You can reach me on Twitter at MattGeorgeSack, email me at MattGeorgeSports at gmail.com, or leave your thoughts in the YouTube comment section down below. For right now, we are done. Thank you so much for your support as always. Can't wait to have you join me on the next episode of Locked On Kings. Until then, my name is Matt George. You've been listening to the Locked On Kings podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network.